Welcome to Between the Vines. My name is Kevin Martin. I'm here with Jennifer Phillips Russo. It's been a couple of weeks since we had a chance to sit down and talk to you, uh, do a recording. So we do have quite a bit to update you on uh, in terms of what's been going on in the industry. All the way back to the 17th of August, we had some price announcement data, a lot of other stuff going on. I think we're not going to go in chronological order today. We're just going to go in terms of like what we think is most important to the industry. So some strange, I think, happenings in Buffalo, something we all expected. I'm going to let Jennifer cover that since she was up in Buffalo and checking it out and found some stuff. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Hi, everybody. Unfortunately, it's not good news. We do have an established population of the invasive spotted lantern fly in Buffalo, New York. It is right along, as we have been suspecting, a railroad line. We were hopeful that it might just be a couple adults. I went out myself and worked with the Department of Ag and Markets inspectors, and we did some more looking around in the, the area and have found more than 100 live adults in that area. So it is definitely an established population and I would expect to see it move and us noticing some maybe in our vineyards this year or next. So it's definitely here and it's something that now we have to start paying attention to because it's it's not a problem until it's a problem, right? So if we can get out there and just be diligent and be mindful as you're harvesting or renting equipment from other areas, checking for egg masses, you're going to find the adult stage right now. There should not be any nymphs out there. And there are plenty, plenty of videos and photos online, New York State IPM, Ag and Markets, DEC, our website, lergp.com. We have a lot of photos out there of what you should look for. If you find it, We have, there is a website that is called reportslf.com. That will take you directly to the reporting site. It is very important that if you find one, you collect it, you kill it, and then you report it. So report to reportslf.com. That is so that we can track the movement of this bug and hopefully keep the numbers low enough. So it's just something, another thing we need to manage in the vineyard. I did have a grower talk to me about it and they were they made the analogy to a video game. It's like the spotted lantern fly. You just leveled up to the next levels. <laughs> so when you say established population, Jen, that means in all likelihood there was an adult here last year laying eggs, right? Yes. Either or more than one. Yes. Well, and that is my assumption of more than one because I went out and collected specimens yesterday and they were of random sizes that if it was one egg casing you would expect them to all sort of be the same size but okay. yeah these look like they were differential hatching okay they're right. easy to kill by the way and they don't harm humans or animals they don't bite they don't sting i apologize i know it sounds cruel but you need to squish it to help save our industry <laughs> and you know maybe our sanity <laughs> yeah i mean most of um most of the, I think our, our focus on this podcast is to our industry. So yeah. most of the, our listeners are growing grapes. So I don't know, very little concern over harm to humans. As long as they harm grapes, we're, we're interested in killing it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'll, along those notes, uh, along that note, uh, one of the things that I've found promising from just a business case of how, you know, we're going to survive this is that we've seen this population ebb and flow once it does get established. So it won't necessarily be, um, you know, the apocalypse every single year, year, year in and year out is at least what it looks like in Southeast PA, which is hopefully the worst it will ever be. Hopefully we never even get it that bad. But even if we do, um, that population ebbs and flows and we can kill it with insecticidal soap so we don't have to worry about reharvest entry and we don't have to worry about running out of materials um, probably do have to worry about running out of good materials like uh, so for some of your late harvest stuff even concord you might consider late harvest um, you know you're, you're probably going to want to target this as soon as you start seeing adults if you have a severe problem and you're going to want to use you know leverage 360 or something that lasts longer if you're not harvesting right away and you can squeeze that in so you're going to actually spend a decent amount of money on insecticides that is kind of brand new to you, unfortunately. But but I don't think it's it doesn't seem like it's going to be like Drosophila was to small fruit, where they just 
I don't know. It seems like there's like a level of acceptance. They, they were resistant to everything. Um, you have to spray all the time. I, I, I think there are probably a lot of growers that have given up on raspberries or have made illegal applications to try to get through. I don't think you're going to have to do any of that with grapes. I think the biggest concern is just making sure um, you're prepared to add all these production practices, even if they are affordable, they're different. So, it, you know, the labor, the labor supply, the equipment planning is all different than what you're used to. Uh, and so all that's going to have to be done during this winter and during the growing season, you're going to have to be ready to go next year, especially if you're, I mean, I think anybody's going to have to be pretty close to ready to go. But if I was in Erie County, New York, or that side of Chautauqua County or Niagara County, it seems like that's going to be the first place they end up if they spread from this population. So even more, even more important, I think, than say, you know, we don't have any signs yet, but it, you know, once we do, if we hear about it in Erie County, Pennsylvania, then, then they'll be sort of next on the concern list. But, but if they spread geographically as they have tended to do, I think from where they get established, um, you know, it seems like one County a year, unless they're hitchhiking. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what I would prepare for. And I'd make sure I had a sprayer and someone to run it during harvest. Oh, so I would just like to add that if you are interested in looking to see what insecticides you can are labeled for spotted lantern fly, you can go to the New York state IPM.cornell.edu website and it's right there. They'll you just slick the select the, you know, insecticides for use on spotted lantern fly. There's a list also for homeowners. All right. All right. So, uh, that's, almost for next year if you're a grape grower trying to plan for management um, and if we're planning management this year we're looking at um, you know concord grape harvest right around the corner wine grape harvest has already started um, what are things looking at i know you do a lot of raisin harvest stuff in terms of bricks acid berry weight what have you found in terms of progress this year well, things are definitely moving along with the hot weather we have, unless you've had disease move in. And there are unfortunately some vineyards dealing with some downy mildew and slowing down bricks accumulation. <clears throat> Pardon me. Like our big null that we do, I can just tell you about the varieties that we have that have information from yesterday. And our big are at 19 bricks right now. Um, I don't, we don't do the TAs on that. We just have some bricks and some sizing and they're, Definitely increased from last week. Not a lot, but they were 18.8 last week. They're 19 this week. Same thing, Niagara's were 13.2 last week. They're 14.2 this week, an entire brick. Then we're at our Savals are at 18.3. We'll see our Rieslings. Rieslings are coming in at 16.1. Vincent's are coming in at 15.1. Ives, 14.6. Delaware, 18.9. So I do know that um, a lot of Savals have been harvested lately. Yep. Still have Marquettes are, are gone. And Niagara's opened up at the juice processing plants. So Niagara's are being harvested. Yeah, I think we're about 10 days away from Concord. So if we can stay warm, at least the, the bricks that you're taking should be right along in line with being just ripe enough to harvest on the first day. I can tell you the Concords in our variety in our um, phenology block that we monitor weekly, and Dr. Terry Bates does his um, Concord Berry Curve off of. Those are averaging uh, 15. So we have one of our treatments is at 15.3, and the other one is at 14.6. <clears throat> so and the berries are over three gram. Right, and I'm, I've seen through the emails from the processor that you know it's sort of time to start taking those brick samples to see how things are accumulating in your own vineyards take as many of those as you have time to take because you're going to find that kind of stuff in your vineyard as well so there's obviously going to be stuff on the 19th that isn't ready to harvest or at least if it is ready it's going to make you sweat and and it looks like there's going to be some blocks where there's at least for a lot of growers, there's no reason to, to be nervous about it. So like the stuff that we have that's 15 now, we actually probably wanna make sure we get it off that first week before it, you know, quality starts to degrade. And I think that's that stuff's gonna be around. I mean, um, there's nothing in our phenology block that looks as bad as some of the vineyards that um, really took a hit over the winter 
especially if it was in winter injury related, but even if it was like crop load related from last year, you know, there's some stuff around that's for a ton to the acre and that stuff probably you want to make sure you pick it all in September if you can this year. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I did have a couple calls from some growers asking about the longevity. If you do have an average size crop and you're already at 15 bricks, can you actually hold it off on the lawn, on the vine until, or do we have to worry about it shattering? Is it going to end up on the vineyard floor? And I sat down and had a conversation with Dr. Terry Bates about this. And he had mentioned, if you were a grower and your vines are balanced and they're healthy, there should be no problem leaving that fruit on the lawn, on the vine. It will continue to ripen and it should not shatter. But, you know, the weather creating the way it keep going the way it's been. I've had other growers call me this week asking why their concords are splitting when they've only received a half inch of rain. And in talking with Brian Head, one of our colleagues at PSU, we were trying to figure that out because a half inch doesn't seem like that should happen. That should cause the splitting. And he said, well, Jen, we've had four days at 90 degree humidity and those berries are still going to keep sucking in that water. So then just the 90 degrees humidity and then the water, the rain as well could cause the splitting. Yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, in terms of what Terry's saying, there are a whole lot of ifs along with that statement that are not necessarily unusual occurrences in commercial vineyards. So, you know, you start to see bricks get over 16 and berry weight more than double so that the elasticity of that that berry is is at its max. I just think it's more vulnerable to any issues that realistically just happen in commercial vineyards. Uh, there's a bunch of vineyards around based on our weather stations that are probably going to have consistent great berry moth pressure. Um, so secondary rots above 15 are going to be worse than they would be at 13 and so I, that's where i would target my harvest and i would be calling my processor and trying to see if if that's the situation i was in what kind of schedule i could get that first week so if there are cancellations you know i would say it's worth losing sleep over and and harvesting more early i would guess though that there is enough acreage like that that you're not going to get too much extra this is not a year where everybody's you know, hitting the starting gate at 13 bricks and it's really easy to get 10 extra loads a day. I don't, I don't think it's one of those years, but uh, certainly pick the loads you have scheduled and pick the ones that are that are either most ripe or most vulner vulnerable to berry moth or, or other issues, because I think all of these issues start as soon as things are are at minimum quality standards. Mm -hmm. So what that means is if you have a block at 15 and a block at 17, if that block is right next to the woods and you know the berry moth is bad there, it's only going to get worse. So even though it's a little lower in bricks, maybe I'd start there. Um, Kevin, wasn't there also the, uh, you mentioned it earlier in the intro, that the pricing August 17th came out. Well, yeah, before we get to that, you mentioned downy mildew and I haven't really seen too much. And um, do you, what kind of conditions are you seeing a lot of downy mildew in? Is it, are you seeing it in Concord or Niagara? I mean, especially Niagara, cause you could be. I haven't, it's actually with people who are, are trying to farm sustainably without restricted chemicals. And I respect everybody's decision, but there were definitely a lot of rain events that had happened and it's just becoming a problem right now. And unfortunately there's not much that can be done at this point, except for a copper or captain, and that can slow down fermentation or potentially stop it. So, yes, okay. I would suggest just having and look at your spray program. Let's say that look at your spray program and decide if you are rotating chemicals and make sure that if you have questions, you give us a call. We'll have a program put together actually in December where we're going to have Dr. Katie Gold and Brian Head talk about spray programs so you can get a jump on your purchasing of chemicals for the next year. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate what you're trying to say. I think we all try to farm sustainably, but um, yeah, I think that's a good reminder for growers that are growing for processors like Gallo next year. Not that they've had these concerns as much this year, but downy mildew materials are gonna be limited as are, um, or, or there's going to be an increase in reliance on sulfur uh, because not, it's not just a limitation on downy mildew materials. So early season protectants in those vulnerable varieties is going to be way more important than it has been in the past. Not to say that it hasn't been important, but 
but the sort of materials that do okay in ter terms of trying to salvage a problem, which is sort of how I characterize what you try to do once you have a real problem established, there some of those are, tools are going to be missing from your toolbox. So you're not going to be able to do that. Just kind of like what you're articulating with maybe really late season control, only using kinder, gentler chemicals of downy mildew in vinifera is just, you don't have a lot of great options at that point. Right. Um, but yeah, we could talk about money too, since, you know, usually I'm doom and gloom and now it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you have good news for us. <laughs> At least in 2022, the downfall of the industry will be insects or diseases or viticulture, not business. <laughs> not my fault this year. Uh, so we definitely saw processors trying to do things to make sure in the cash market that they are not going to lose con concords that are contracted to them. So, you know, um, they wanna make sure everything that is contracted to them goes to them, whether that's through enforcement or high enough prices so that their pricing is competitive, they're, they're, doing, they're doing that. Um, so what that means is it looked like on the 17th when they announced prices, that prices would be, you know, averaging around $375 a ton. Um, that I would say has been adjusted upward because there was some flexibility in those price announcements for trucking and trucking allowances have come back not only higher because trucking is more expensive, but probably also higher than market cost to try to make sure everybody was in line with current cash market prices. So we should see Concord prices very close to averaging $400 a ton. Fantastic. Um, obviously, two thirds of the market is cooperative, so we have no idea what that price is going to be. It's not only is it not announced, it's based on profits that will not even come close to being realized until, you know, the later part of 2022. So I would have to completely speculate. Uh, what we do know is the um, the cooperative market has been moving upward in price faster than the cash market. And what I mean by that is they realize these profits and then they pay them back to the growers. So say for the 2021 crop, at least in current market conditions, the cooperatives are paying more than the cash market. And we don't see anything to indicate that those prices are going to fall in the future, at least on average across all cooperatives. There might be a cooperative here or there that has to, uh, because they're paying their profits. So if they start investing in their business in a different way, an individual cooperative might change relative to the market as that cooperative elects to invest in their business or something. But overall, it, there is nothing to indicate that I know of that those prices would be falling yet. Uh, that, that can obviously change very quickly. Um, but just in terms of what we know about production going on in other regions and the current demand and the current supply on hand, we really don't have anything to indicate that prices are going to fall. Uh, in general, typically, the cooperative market prices will fall first because they pay later. So, you know, if the market tanks in March, if we all of a sudden start to see a surplus, Obviously, the cash market already paid you, so they're stuck with overpriced juice and they just have to figure out that problem for themselves. Whereas with a cooperative, uh, the timing is different. So technically that we'll say 2025 crop that they took that, you know, suddenly in a surprise surplus situation, uh, they will adjust immediately and accordingly because their profits will be adjusted. So we would expect them to fall first. We just don't have any information that would indicate that they would fall. So. It, I mean, it looks like business as usual in that $400 a ton or $375 a ton area. Niagara grape prices are all over the place. It seems like in general, the juice market is healthy enough to pay almost on parity with Concords. So they're paying almost as much for Niagara's as they are with Concords. I don't know if they want that juice that much or if they're just saying in terms of equity to maintain the sustainability of those growers. So when they do want it, they have it, that they're going to pay parity, you know, close to $400 a ton for Niagara. That's what they're doing. Um, Niagara's used for wine. That's a little bit more of a mess. That'll probably be under $300 a ton. It's not a disaster. It just looks really bad compared to Concord because they're harder to grow. Um, 
for a lot of growers, it's harder to get the same yields, at least consistently. It's a lot easier to get 10 tons to the acre on Niagara, but not to do it three years in a row. Um, so, so usually we used to expect those prices to be higher. And obviously because of market conditions, they haven't been in quite a while. So that's not great news if you're a big Niagara grower, but they are high enough so that it's not a disaster yet. Um, hybrids and other wines, I mean, I, that market is very stable and not growing. And I think in not growing on the wine side, uh, we are seeing a bit of a surplus on the juice side for growers growing those varieties. Uh, there's a whole lot of hybrids. I mean, there's too many to talk about. So results sort of do vary with which hybrids you're growing. Um, you know, weird things like Baco are commanding a premium right now because nobody wanted to grow Baco because it was terrible. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, that was what the general opinion of winemakers was for a little while. But I think the people who stuck with Baco, now there's so little left that, that you see a bit of a premium. So results are really going to vary with hybrids. Um, those medium aged hybrids in general are probably the worst, like the stuff, the varieties that came out 20 years ago. So they were fairly widely planted. Certainly none of them have really been removed yet or given up on. Um, the good news is they were bred very well, so they're pretty easy to grow. Uh, but but relative to the price of Concord, they're not super exciting now because you're, you're getting paid like the same or a little bit more than you would for Concord. Uh, so I don't think that's necessarily gonna entice too many people to, to plant those varieties. Um, so the natives uh, are for the most part also fairly highly priced, like the ones for wine, uh, but it is a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, there are just too many to talk about and they're fairly small in terms of what their mark markets are. Um, but but the smaller ones that are more unusual are, are commanding a bit of a premium right now, most of them. Uh, but it's really mixed and vinifera prices are pretty stable, which is probably bad news because there's a lot of labor, labor tied up in vinifera and labor prices have been problematic. So you'd expect those prices to go up and given the current state of the market, they haven't really moved that much. So it's not, it's not bad. It's not as bad as hybrids. I think with hybrids, I have heard some growers are being, um, they're having their contracts reduced or having surplus crop that isn't deliverable. So they mm -hmm. can, they can deliver their contract and that's it. I haven't heard that with vinifera too. Although we don't have very many large vinifera growers in our region that don't just sell it to their own winery. So usually they can figure out what to do with an extra five ton of Riesling or 10 ton of Riesling because it's theirs to sell to themselves. But, um, and, and I, I haven't heard from the Finger Lakes to see what they've been doing with their vinifera. And that's usually where you see a surplus driving prices one way or the other. Well, it sounds like good news and bad news. I mean, good news. Yeah, I mean, for 90% of our industry, it's good news. It's not great news. It's just the news that we need because we know the price of inputs are up. So we're going to spend this money. Um, I think we are playing with bigger numbers. I think net profits have a potential to be higher, but it's going to take more money to get there. So it's like, you know, you, you spend 30% more, you make 30% more. So that there's that there's more risk associated with that. Like if you were if you were planning on keeping six to 12 months in reserve in your checking account, it's gonna take you a couple of years to to build up your checking accounts enough to keep that cash reserves because all the numbers you're playing with are now larger on both sides. Ooh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I have to get going. <laughs> all right. Um that was the child. Mom, come pick me up. I'm alone in the parking lot. <laughs> okay. So um, in terms of price, things are pretty good. If we learn more about prices from the Finger Lakes, I we are going to take a few minutes to share them. Um, good luck with harvest to all of you. We hope, hopefully we'll start doing this on a weekly basis again. And what that'll mean is before Concord harvest starts rolling, we'll, we'll be here again. Uh, hopefully there's a little bit less to update on because we covered three weeks of material this this week. Um, but I'm sure there's probably one or two things we forgot because we did have so much stuff. So uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us on Between the Vines. And have a great week, everyone. You too.